Hello and welcome to the first episode of Advocata's video series on the tea industry of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has the highest cost of production in the world for tea, with a kilogram of made tea costing around 950 Sri Lankan rupees to produce at Sri Lanka's regional plantation companies, which cultivate government-owned estate land under a temporary lease. A main culprit of these high costs are labour costs, which make up around 70% of the cost of production of regional plantation companies. The labour share of the cost of production does not exceed 50% in Kenya and India, the other major black tea producing countries in the world. The question is, what exactly makes the cost of production of tea so high for regional plantation companies? The 1000 rupee daily minimum wage in the plantation sector is heavily responsible for the high costs of production. The labour rate paid to the pluckers in Sri Lanka who make up more than 50% of the workforce of the average estate is more than double of what a plucker is paid for the same amount of plucked green leaf in Kenya and India. The labour costs of production, however, do not stop at the minimum wage. Estates provide other cash and non-cash benefits to the workers, such as dry rations, housing, healthcare and childcare, which add up to a cost of around 1,750 rupees per day per worker, bringing the actual labour rate substantially higher than what the minimum wage suggests. As not all estate residents contribute their labour to the estates, estates generally spend a substantial amount of money on non-worker residents that were not considered in these calculations. With those added, the actual labour rate becomes even higher. In addition to leading to high costs of production, the 1000 rupee minimum wage also disincentivizes productivity making Sri Lanka's estate workers the least productive among those in major tea-producing countries. The minimum wage model that is currently in place in the estate sector is devoid of any productivity incentives. In fact, any plucker who plucks a minimum of 18 kilograms of green leaf is legally entitled to the 1000 rupee daily wage, which leads to a lower plucking average per worker than in any other major tea-producing country. In contrast, in the tea smallholder sector, where the free market trains supreme for the most part and there is no government imposed minimum wage, the labour rate is substantially lower and the productivity much higher. For those unfamiliar, the tea smallholder sector consists of small-scale farmers who on average own less than one acre of cultivated tea land. As small holdings are not legally considered estates, they are not bound by the minimum wage law and have the freedom to pay workers the market wage rate. A female labourer, usually hired for plucking, is paid a daily wage of around 1,250 rupees on average for a daily plucking average of 30 kilograms. As such, the cost of production in the smallholder sector is much lower. The minimum wage model, although popularly built as a guarantee of a living wage for estate workers, imposes an upper ceiling on the earnings of estate workers. Given the lack of incentives built into the minimum wage model to reward higher plucking rates, the minimum wage model indirectly penalizes higher productivity workers by unfairly not compensating them for their higher efficiency. This market failure means that over time, the plucking average of higher productivity workers also converges to the lower end, robbing the industry of the efficiency gains that could otherwise have been realized from the higher productivity workers. Despite these labor market distortions of the minimum wage that increases the cost of production, decreases productivity and imposes an upper ceiling on the earnings of estate workers, the minimum wage model remains popular among most estate workers, the trade unions that represent them and policymakers. In fact, the most recent increase of the minimum wage to the 1000 rupees in 2021 was an election pledge by former president Gota Bay Rajapaksa, whose 2019 manifesto built it as a means to grant estate communities with a good economy, quality housing, education, and healthcare facilities to lead a comfortable life. There is some truth to this sentiment. In fact, when the minimum wage was increased to 1000 rupees, estate workers began earning substantially above the daily living wage required for subsistence, as estimated by the Global Living Wage Coalition. Even after inflation skyrocketed with the onset of economic crisis, estate workers were still earning above the living wage approximated by the Global Living Wage Coalition, 
when non-cash benefits received by workers are also considered. But statistics show that the minimum wage, despite its wide popularity, still does little to promote estate employment among estate residents. In fact, the share of estate residents who contribute their labor to the estates has dropped significantly in the last several years, with less than one in five estate residents currently being employed at the estates. These numbers are a testament to the fact that younger generations do not find estate work an appealing choice of occupation anymore, partly due to the lower social status associated with estate work and partly due to the upper ceiling on the earning potential of estate employees imposed by the minimum wage system. Estate residents find it far more appealing to find work outside of the estates in workplaces such as garment factories or restaurants while continuing to receive the benefits from estates that they are entitled to as estate residents. Some youths leave their families behind in the estates and move to cities such as Colombo to work as housemaids, cooks and in various odd jobs because of the higher pay, greater freedom and the better opportunities for social advancement that it offers to them. In this context, it is imperative that we ask the question, is the attendance-based daily minimum wage the only way to provide the tea industry workers with favorable economic circumstances? Or are there alternative wage models that could guarantee a living wage for the workers while also raising the dignity of their profession? The revenue share model is becoming increasingly popular among estates who find the high cost of production imposed by the minimum wage model infeasible. It is an alternative remuneration structure that assigns each worker a block of land in the estate to cultivate and harvest. Workers are paid a pre predetermined share of the price the tea from their block of land sells at the auction. Given that the auction price is based on the quality of the tea made, the revenue share model has built-in incentives for workers to optimize their own earnings through higher quality production. The revenue share model encourages more productivity by rewarding workers based on their performance. It also provides workers with flexible work hours, a sense of land ownership and agency in work, helping change perceptions of the value assigned to unskilled labor in the plantation industry. While the workers under the revenue share model still require some sort of supervision as incentives for quality control are built into the compensation formula. Less supervision is necessary to ensure that the quality of production is retained. Less supervision could help boost the dignity of workers, potentially increasing their enthusiasm to engage in plantation sector employment. Data from estates that have adopted the revenue share model show that Worker earnings have substantially increased since moving away from the minimum wage model and estate profits have also followed suit for the most part. However, labor unions are still not 100% in support of alternative wage models of this form, which makes sense when one thinks about the potential of this kind of wage models to eliminate the role of trade unions in managing the relationship between estate management and estate workers. But given the inevitable demise of the relevance of the minimum wage model, trade unions have as of late become more receptive to the idea of alternative wage models. In fact, the Ceylon Workers Congress has put forth their own demands, including that revenue share models should only accompany and not replace the attendance-based minimum wage model in estates. The mere fact that unions are negotiating and not outright resisting the implementation of the hybrid model is evidence that the minimum wage model on its own has outlived its purpose. With greater earning potential and greater freedoms, the revenue share model is more conducive towards worker retention in the estates compared to the minimum wage model. However, alternative wage models can only go so far in attracting workers. There is much more that can be done to improve the work culture and living conditions of estate workers. Given the tea industry's colonial history, many estates have retained certain influences of colonial management systems, which can be best described as outdated. More dignified job titles, safety gear, and corporate social responsibility programs aimed at uplifting workers' standards of living could help improve dignity in their profession and help retain the estate workforce. Programs aimed at combating the high prevalence of alcoholism among estate communities 
could also help in this regard. Because estate housing instead on tea lands are owned by the government, the regional plantation companies that manage tea estates are not allowed to evict those who do not contribute their labor to the estates. Financially, it is not sustainable for estates to keep providing housing and other non-cash benefits to those who do not work at the estates. Limiting estate housing to those who actually live on the estates will put a halt to this problem of free riding and ease the financial burden on plantation companies. Such a move, however, is not the easiest to justify in the eyes of the larger public. Estate communities are a historically marginalized group in Sri Lanka and mass evictions of these communities from estates for not offering their labor to the estates would be controversial, to say the least. In addition to the moral argument to be made here, such a move could jeopardize the reputation of Ceylon tea around the world. How else can the labor market distortions currently driving up the cost of production in the tea estates be addressed? Maybe it is time to let the free market take over once and for all. Granting deeds to those living in estate housing will be a win-win situation for both estate management and estate residents. There will no longer be a need to spend estate funds on the upkeep of estate residents, allowing the cost of production to come down. On the other hand, estate residents who no longer want to live on the estates will be able to sell their housing units and move out. The most significant economic disadvantage that estate workers face in comparison to other populations is the lack of property ownership, which impacts their ability to both build wealth based on real estate and relocate outside of estates if they wish to do so. Granting property ownership would not only better integrate the estate communities with the rest of the island, but will also incentivize plantation companies to compete in the larger labor market, not just among those residing on estates, to source workers for the tea estates. If estates are able to offer attractive compensation packages with the potential for a dignified occupation, it would not be difficult to overcome the labor shortage issues that estates currently experience. In reality though, the likelihood of a complete free market takeover of the estate workforce and estate land is very slim. In this context, estate management has to be creative with how they approach the topic of labor and automation should not be off the table. A lot of factory workers have been replaced by machinery in the last few decades Although plucking is still almost exclusively performed by human workers, the Tea Research Institute has developed technology that could help automate the process. If tea estates effectively automate their plucking activities, it would lead to lower plucking costs, more consistency in the plucking costs, and higher plucking efficiency. But there is little consensus within the industry as to whether automation would reduce the quality of the tea plucked. To move forward with automation in plucking, it is important to first conduct a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis of automation. If none of these strategies work, the relatively price and elastic nature of tea may be the industry's last saving grace. Tea is generally considered a beverage with an elastic demand. First, what is an inelastic good? An inelastic good is a good where the demand drops less than proportionate to the increases in price. Tea is an inelastic good because it only makes up a fraction of the monthly expenses of a household, which means that a slight increase in the price will not decrease demand by too much. Tea is also a habit-forming good that has no cheap alternative because both coffee and carbonated beverages are usually more expensive than tea. This means that even in the event of a slight increase in the price, consumers are less likely to switch over to another beverage. This is great news for the tea industry of Sri Lanka because it gives some room to the local producers to transfer the high costs of production to the end consumer in the form of higher prices. The local tea industry may well exploit this possibility, particularly given the lack of credible alternatives to the type of tea that Sri Lanka sells in the international market, orthodox black tea. Economic theory thus dictates that for habitual consumers of Sri Lanka's orthodox black tea, a slight increase in the price, marketed as a means of granting a living wage to the tea industry workers, should not be a deal breaker. But such a move would do little to address the market distortions of the present wage model and the broad inefficiencies that result from it. 